Welcome to the Political Philosophy Podcast. I'm Toby Buckle. The episode you're about to listen to is a conversation with Professor Olufemi Taiwo. He is an assistant professor at Georgetown University and the author of Reconsidering Reparations, which has just come out with OUP and is the subject of this conversation, where we look at what reparations ought to mean and ought to mean in a global scale. I've got a few updates on the podcast and what's coming down the line. I've actually got quite a few updates, so I think what I'm going to do is for this episode, I'm just going to get straight to the interview, and then I might do a short, like, mini episode where I talk about the future of the podcast and invite some feedback from the audience. I think this episode is fairly self-explanatory and self-contained, so I won't do too much of an introduction other than to recommend the Reconsidering Reparations book. It's both an in-depth and serious analysis of the topic, but also a pretty accessible and enjoyable read. It's one I liked a lot. So I definitely recommend that if you find this conversation interesting. Um, Apart from that, if you're new to the channel, consider subscribing. I'm currently trying to get most of the interviews out on YouTube as well, so you can watch them in video if you want. This one's in video and audio, so if you're listening to audio and you want to watch the video, or vice versa, um, I'll include the links to both in the show notes. Um, Apart from that, oh, and if you're a returning uh, viewer and you've watched a certain amount of my content at this point and you like it, uh, consider supporting me on Patreon. As you'll no doubt know at this point, um, I don't do any commercial advertisements. I don't pause conversations to try and sell you razors or underwear or hair loss products. I just don't personally vibe with that, and I think in long-form engaged conversations it kind of spoils it, honestly. So I just nag you all at the beginning of every episode to check out my Patreon, patreon.com stroke political philosophy podcast, patreon.com stroke political philosophy podcast. And, you know, if you think the conversation you're about to listen to is worth a couple of bucks, then it would be great to have them. All the costs associated with the show are covered by listeners. And for anyone who does subscribe, who does share content like this on their own social media, and or who sponsors us on Patreon, thank you so much. You're awesome. You're making the show possible to go out for free to thousands of people, providing hopefully interesting takes on the world. So, I think that's everything. Let's get straight to it. This is Global Reparations with Professor Olufemi Taiwo. Okay, I am joined today by Professor Olufemi Taiwo. Uh, Professor, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. So just by way of introduction, um, for anyone who might not be familiar with you, what's like a quick potted academic bio? What do you like to write and teach and think about? Uh, I mean, I guess at this point, I would say uh, I do social political philosophy ethics and Africana philosophy and topics wise um, I've been writing a lot about climate justice and related issues and you're you have we're going to do the reparations book today but you have two books coming out in like quite short succession right 
How did yeah. how did that happen? Did that not like completely overwhelm you, or was there like some story behind that? Not really a story. It's just a weird trick of timing with the pandemic. Um, so I've been working on the reparations book since grad school. So for a few years, um, and it just happened that um, while I was on the back end of that, you know, final revisions and um, indexing and all that stuff that you have to do at the end. That's when, um, my second elite capture piece essay got a lot of attention, folks reading it. Um, and so I kind of converted those essays to a book length thing. So, so it wasn't me writing two books at the same time. It was, you know, me writing a couple essays while editing a book that had already largely been written. So the timing just kind of was strange. In my experience, um, I've only got one book, but it kind of happens very, very slowly, and then, like, all at once. Yeah. Like, you've, you've got this project, and, like, it feels like it's never going to quite get off the ground, then all of a sudden it's like, Okay, and we need your copy edits next month. You're you're good with all that, right? And I'm like, yep. yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I barely remember what I said. I had no idea what was going on in chapter three, and then you gotta try and make it work and hope for the best. So Yeah, and they're so polite, they're like, you know, I'm a bit confused about what you're saying here. And they're like, Yeah, I don't blame you. That yep. You know. yep. Yep. <laughs> I know that. Yeah. So, um, let's get to reparations then. Um, one thing that, that sort of struck me is you spend quite a lot of time in the beginning of the book setting up what questions you're not addressing. Um, I guess, uh, why, why did you think it was important to lay that groundwork? What were the questions you weren't addressing? And why did you think it was important to sort of lay that groundwork out before you got started? So I think the book both kind of goes across disciplines um, in a way, you know, the first chapter, the first substantive chapter of the introduction is just talking mostly about history and then there's some more standard philosophy chapters, then there's a kind of pivot into thinking about social science and environmental science and so on and so forth. So it's, it's not clear what the norms are, even from just an academic perspective that you should be applying to the book. And then on top of that, it's a crossover book. So it's kind of pitched at hopefully a more general audience than the academic reader. And so, you know, my perspective was, you know, there's going to be a bunch of people coming at this from a different directions and they, in each of those kind of sandboxes, there's a way that a book is supposed to be pitched and there's a way that, you know, there's questions that are supposed to be the obvious ones. And, you know, I'm not going to, check anybody's boxes all the way. So I should probably start off by just saying explicitly what I am going to try to do. Um, and all of that is just talking about the way that the book is. But I think the other thing I was thinking about is the way that discussion around racial justice has kind of moved over the years as I've seen it in, you know, the U S uh, maybe, English language media a little more broadly than that. But I think there's been a lot of attention to mapping kind of racial disparities and to answering, you know, the, the other side, whatever the other side is taken to be, whether it's, you know, the right wing party here or there or conservative talk radio or something like that. There's been a lot of debunking projects in think pieces and so on and so forth. And, I don't necessarily think that that's never a thing to do, but it just wasn't what I was trying to do with the book. And so I think just even for the general audience that isn't coming in it with particular academic norms of what they think the book should be, I think there's that other direction of 
you know, expectations folks might have the book for the book that I wasn't trying to hit. So for all those reasons, I was wanting to start off by saying, you know, here's what I'm not doing. So you're not, if I understand you right, you're not writing a book to rebut what uh, Ben Shapiro might say about race. You're yeah. not. Because, I mean, from my perspective, what a lot of that debate can kind of boil down to is racism isn't real versus no, actually it really is, or the history or the legacy of racism or whatever. Right. And we've kind of, like, people have said what they're going to say on that, I feel like, at this yeah. point. Um, there was a couple of bits, I'm going to read you back to you. Um, there was a couple of bits I really liked in the book where it just sort of crystallised a sort of vague instinct I've had for a while, and but, like, put it in a way that, like, made sense. And I was like, yeah, okay, I like that because that's, like articulated something I've kind of had an unease about for a while um, and your introduction was was um, one of them because I mean I'll put my biases on the table I'm from the political left I think the history of racism is real I've said I'll, I would support reparations I haven't like you've done articulated any particular vision of what that might mean but you know as a sort of direction of travel you know um, and I read so much stuff um, Particularly, no, this is actually also increasingly true of the UK, but particularly from the American context, where the, the, and I don't mean to be dismissive of it, but like the entire book or the entire piece is just saying every which way racism is real, I really promise you it's real. Right, right. And I sort of, it's not bad per se, I just sort of feel like I've read that book already, you know? Mm -hmm. And you wrote, quote, an entire industry of racial commentary, from think pieces to blogs to academic studies and whole fields of researchers, centred upon convincing imagined sceptical whites or global northerners that the social sky is in fact blue. End quote. And I loved that. Um, that, like, at some point, I think your critique, if I understood it, is... We're, we're devoting more energy to this than it warrants, and there's kind of like an opportunity cost in that we're not talking about other things, because the sky is in fact blue. You can write an essay saying that the sky is in fact blue. You can, you can debunk flat earthers, that's a fine thing to do. But there's certain people who I just... I'm not saying there's people who... The, the, nobody's reachable on that side but there's people who foundationally don't want to be convinced and it's almost like kind of an injustice imposed on us i guess us here meaning the political left broadly and you could think of other examples it's not just race that we have to spend so long saying that the sky is blue did that make sense yeah yeah um i think i quote um or i cite in any case uh rachel mckinney in the piece who who terms it extracted speech right? right but all this all this speech we have to do to get the foundational assumptions on the table um that we could in a better world simply assume hmm. right and yeah part of what i'm after is you know we have read those pieces before right we have read those books and it's probably good that at some point they were written um, but now we can now we can assume the truth of them, and you know I, I like the flat Earth example because I you know somebody should debunk the flat Earthers, but you know it would be strange if we thought that geology as a field was about debunking the flat Earthers. There are other geological right. questions to ask, right? Um, and so yeah, that's that that was very much a point that I wanted to make going on in the book. You know, it's not as though no work of that kind should exist. Um, but the expectation that anything in this genre should be a work of that kind is a strange one. Um, and I think it's worth calling into question. And and more importantly, it's just worth asking other questions, right? The fact that um, the fact that we are not the unreachable guy on the other side who doesn't even think racism is real does not mean that we have the right account of race or that we have answered all the political questions we ought to be asking about race. And so I think... 
beyond the injustice of just having to pitch everything to that guy. There is a, you know, the unreachable right winger, let's say there's a, there's a further, um, let's say missed opportunity of developing and refining further, you know, the other things that we should be trying to figure out answers to. Perfect. Um, so let's get into, well, maybe one more um, sort of scene setting question. Um, you use the phrase or the term global racial empire a lot. Um, could you define cash that out for us before we sort of get into the argument proper? Because that's, that's going to play a bit of, do a bit of work. Yeah, so there's been two kind of schools of theory which um, in some people's work converged. So there was the development of world systems theory um, and a host of related discourses, you know, combined and uneven developments, um, dependency theory, whatever. But, the, you know, these trends of theory that tried to say, look, the right unit of analysis for thinking about politics is global. You know, there's broader political structures that go beyond the contained units of a national economy. And we need to think about where countries and local economic sectors fit into this broader planet scale hierarchy and production system if we want to understand why they're doing what they're doing, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's also the framework of racial capitalism, where folks were saying in a variety of ways, um, the there's something about race as a governance structure that capitalism perhaps assumes or perhaps perpetuates or that produced capitalism. People run it different ways, but there's some kind of intrinsic relationship between the two. It's not simply that they um, just overlap in historical time period. And so global racial empire is just putting those two insights together. And the only reason for the name global racial empire, you know, it's just the same analysis as these two theories. But all I'm trying to do is to keep present in people's mind how this system was put into place by imperial conquest, by the imperial establishment of planet-sized networks of trade and politics. Um, it were, you know, it was particular a particular segment of history, particular set of actors, and it wasn't the abstract force of commodities being exchanged for money, which are then exchanged for a larger amount of commodities, right? It's not these purely impersonal um, abstract stories about capital circulation, but it's this history of actors doing stuff. Yep, that makes sense. We're living, at its simplest, we're living in a world which is the aftermath of, what would we say, Europe primarily, um, conquering and invading basically everyone else, with one or two exceptions, participating, not participating, like directly managing large-scale transfers of human beings forcibly, um, and that defines literally everything from the borders on the map to the economic systems that we set up. That's that's the view, essentially, as I understand yeah. it. Yeah. Which is sort of our, our sky is blue. Yes. Type point. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> Precisely. Like, like, you can get into what the normative response to that should be, but... Exactly. So, let's get into... Do you mind if we spend a bit of time on the political philosophy side? Because this is the this is the, the, the channel and whatever, um, yeah. and your critique of um, rules, because I always like it when people critique rules. I think it's a bit of a... It, I think it's a bit unfortunate that the first author anyone gets introduced to in our field is 
I'm not saying an unsophisticated thinker, but I mean, my God, no one reads rules and storms the barricade, you know? Right. Um, And I think even passionate Rawlsians will kind of walk a bit sideways from kind of like the law of people's side of rules. Well, whether, yeah, then he was a bit older when he wrote it. He maybe wasn't having a good day or something. <laughs> um, but my understanding, okay, I'll just go, I'll just put it up and put it back to you. My understanding is that rules, particularly later rules, really just doubles down and makes clear when I'm talking about justice, the unit that that's being applied to is a nation state. And we're sort mm-hmm. of measuring how just it might be in terms of its internal relations, in terms of human rights or distribution or whatever. It doesn't really apply between nation states or between group, you know, different groups of people who might be united by something other than nationality or anything like that. Um, and you want to take issue with that quite directly. That's right. And it's it's a bit tricky with Rawls because Rawls takes himself to be giving an ideal theory. So in a way, I think metaphilosophically speaking, it's fair to just say, like, look, I get to stipulate the sort of thing that would be an answer to the question that I'm asking because I'm the questioner. Right. So so my question is, you know, what would be a well-ordered society, let's say? Um, And then Rawls builds in a theory of justice, the set of principles, set of decision making procedures, a set of considerations that would go into answering that question. And so my disagreement with Rawls or, or maybe Rawlsians is fairer to say is is just is less a disagreement about whether or not Rawls has succeeded in that project and more, perhaps more fairly put, is a disagreement about what succeeding at that project would in turn succeed or fail to tell us about the actual world that we live in. Mm. All right. So, you know, the thing I like to emphasize um, when talking about Rawls is the closed society assumption. Mm. He just stipulates the kind of conditions in which the internal principles and rules of a nation state would be the thing that decided whether or not it was a success in terms of justice. So justice for Rawls is going to end up um, attaching itself to the institution that decides how the benefits and burdens of social cooperation are divvied up. And if you assume a closed society, then you've just assumed the conditions where it is the nation state. Um, And then my rejoinder to that is, that's all well and good, (laughs) but if you take a casual glance at the last five centuries of human history, you'll find that it's actually the openness of parts of the world to the rest of the world that explains um, the causal openness of parts of the world to the rest of the world, that explains the possibility of colonialism, that explains what the nation states we have even are, Hmm. and what their borders are, as you pointed out, um, and that arguably, in this arguably neo-colonial moment, largely explains what it is that they're in a position to succeed or fail at doing at the domestic level. So you... Your rejoinder is almost an empirical one. It's, yeah. look at the world. Yes. Yes. Um, so, you know, you could you could look at the philosophical move as kind of a, you know, as, as a let's play trivial or false game mm-hmm. with Rawlsians, right? Either you take it that the closed society assumption reflects some kind of empirical condition mm-hmm. uh, about what institutions actually are important in which case you're on the hook for telling me why living conditions in afghanistan are based on you know what afghanistan decides to do and not what the u.s decided to do 20 years ago Mm -hmm. right um or you just take it to be a definitional thing in which you have to concede that the Rawlsian project simply isn't responsive to the actual world but it's one or the other um you can't have it both ways 
Yeah, I mean, what would a Rawlsian say? They'd say <laughs> it exists in the world, but as a as a metric, as a yardstick. You, it, it's it's supposed to be a realistic utopia in the sense that we can ask not is anyone actually meeting this but how close they get you can go by and sort of society by society measure how far they conform to the principles but it's not like we're saying this is fully realized or even fully realizable i don't know i'm not sure i agree with that that's just what i imagine them saying yeah, I would imagine them saying it too. Um, but, you know, then the question is why we should prefer that metric to any other metric, mm-hmm. right? If, if, if the only thing going for it is that it could conceivably apply to, you know, nations mm-hmm. or nation states, um, then it's hard to say what in a comparative sense it has over any other way of looking at the world. Mm-hmm. And maybe more importantly, it doesn't match Rawls's meta philosophy. So when Rawls talks about the basic structure and defines the basic structure, he's talking in this functionalist sense, right? What is it that actually does the job of deciding who gets bene- what benefits and burdens mm-hmm. from social cooperation? You know, for me, the better move is to actually accept that and then just treat as an empirical question. Well, what is it that does? Hmm. Right. If it's the IMF, then that's the sort of thing we should be giving this kind of Rawlsian treatment to. Um, if it actually is the uh, borders of any particular nation state, then we can give a Rawlsian sort of treatment to that. But the idea that we're just going to totally ignore whatever does um split up the benefits and burdens of social cooperation and we're just going to track whatever you know words are analogous in the Rawlsian theory in the actual world just strikes me as unserious yeah you developed a further line of critique um around i don't have the quote in front of me but essentially Rawls presents quite a time static vision of what achieving justice was like and you're very keen to emphasize the temporal component. Um, well, I'll just put that back to you. Could, you. could you explain what you mean by that and then why emphasizing time and processes is important for you? Yeah, so you could have a view, you could have what I call a snapshot view of distributive justice, where you know we figure out our theory of distributive justice, maybe we're radical egalitarians or maybe we're luck egalitarians, but there's something that you should have a certain amount of. Maybe it's wealth, maybe it's Rawlsian primary goods, uh, maybe it's luck in some kind of probabilistic sense that you could have. Um, But there's something that you should have a certain amount of, and then we just see how much of it that you have, and we revise up or down, right? So in abstraction from the processual um, aspects of our social system that explain why you have the amount that you do have, um, or the ones that would explain whether or not you keep the amount that we might give you in some sort of compensatory transfer, et cetera, um, and what that snapshot, what that snapshot of distributive justice would be missing is, from my point of view, the whole ball game. Like the thing we're actually trying to evaluate <laughs> are the processes, right? That you know, we're just in any one moment, in any snapshot that we could take of distributions, we're just seeing the causal imprint of yesterday's processes. Um, So we should have a more historical view of distributive justice, the kind that evaluates not just um, where resources or holdings have ended up on any particular day, but why and what explains those. Um, That's the kind of account of distributive justice that your Nozicks have, Mm. um, but it's also the kind that is, I think, premised in many reparations arguments as well, and I think it's just better philosophically, and it's better in general. 
So wait, hang on. I, I think I misheard you. The the Nozick style, you think... No, the Nozick style you're not saying is better in general. You're saying the Nozick style is representative of a static thing that you want to move away from? No, Rawls is the static thing. Rawls is the static N- thing. Nozick is the historical thing. Right. And, yeah. and so, yeah. And so he... That is an example within standard analytic philosophy of something that you also see outside of analytic philosophy, which is there, there taking is, process into account. You wouldn't necessarily think it, but there is a reparations argument to be dug out of Nozak, because yeah. his whole thing is its not the way I would go with a reparations argument, but his whole thing is justice and transfer, right? So you make something, you own it, you freely trade it. Cool. Yeah. And then he's sort of forced to admit, well, obviously the existing distribution is unjust because let's just say the whole global race, ra- racial empire thing we just mentioned, or internal patterns of domination within countries, and the epistemic problem that there's no way you could trace back who stole what from who. Right. And so there's this one tiny bit in state anarchy where he just throws up his hands and says, okay, fine, let's just do like a one time distribution. But after that, we go libertarian. Yep. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, Nozick just got here. Nozick, <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I wouldn't go the Nozick route either. But, yeah, I mean, Nozick is just committed to, in the way that Locke is committed to reparations, hmm. right? Um, Bernie Boxel and other philosophers have pointed this out about Locke. You can get a, you can fairly straightforwardly mine a reparations for slavery argument out of Locke, who's actually fairly explicit about his commitment to reparations. Um, I think the same is true of Nozick. Um, His view just, I think, quite straightforwardly implies that you have to do something that would be functionally reparatory. You would have to do redistribution on that scale. Um, And the reasoning for it, as you you put it, just, just is if not overlapping with identical to the uh, reparations rationale, right? Um, and and the people who make reparations arguments in the philosophical literature on the unjust enrichment side of the debate say things that are quite similar to what no success. I'm just having this thought for the first time now, but that's not... So you you distinguish, to move forward a little bit in the argument, um, your conception of justice as constructive and, and sort of, to a degree, forward-looking against mm-hmm. sort of harm-repair models. Nozak's... Am I, am I crazy in putting this together? Nozak's not a million miles away from a harm-repair model in many ways, just quite a pure version of it. He yeah. doesn't use the word reparations, but that's what the argument is essentially yeah i think you could see it as a harm repair argument you could also even see it as a you know you could see it as a it would be compatible with the constructive view if you thought that the just world was the anarcho libertarian Mm -hmm. one right um but but yes i think nozick is very clearly read and very faithfully read i think under either of those headings Yeah, I guess my concern with Nozak is just, I I could give arguments as to why, but I'm not sure justice in transfer is the most important moral constraint I'm concerned with, and then I I don't, I'm not sure you just do a one-time thing, and then whatever emerges, whatever distributional, whatever emerges in that anarcho-libertarian space, we just have to accept. I don't see why you couldn't do the redistribution and then just sort of continually course correct to right. try, you know, I don't, I don't see why it, it couldn't be a sort of ongoing thing. But it is interesting that there's that, that explicit an argument in sort of what gets held up as the arch-libertarian. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is interesting. And I think, you know, Nozick is more honest and serious than a lot of people making those arguments and even conceding that his view has this liberty, this, um, this um, condition, um, which many libertarians would not, even on the libertarian socialist side of things. Um, I, I, agree with you both in 
you know, I, I wouldn't adapt kind of anarcho-libertarianism as a, as a just end state. Hmm. And I also think that the one-off response is a little reductive about what it comes to, about what the historical accumulation of injustice comes to. If, if it really is reducible to just disparities and holdings, right? And so the only thing that you have to correct are disparities and holdings. I think that's, that's a much more optimistic view of what the result of five centuries of human oppression are on culture and are on, on the, you know, the likely behavioral patterns that will result. Um, so yeah, I think there's a number of places that I get off the boat with Nozick, but it's, um, but it is remarkable how little daylight there is between his view and a lot of people's, you know, a lot of people's view on reparations who would see themselves as starkly opposed to that kind of figure. This actually, I feel like I'm not pursuing people, I am pursuing an utter tangent, but um, this does actually relate back to your book, because you sort of trace through, a, like, a snapshot history of, like, political philosophy, egalitarianism sort of debates, and I think we've sort of seen a move away from... Uh, a, a way of arguing for a progressive conclusion that it seems to work from quite conservative or at least sort of libertarianish foundations. So there's the sort of Nozick justice and transfer thing. Um, but mm -hmm. you also, I would argue something similar in the case of, say, luck egalitarianism, in that you're sort of assuming an individualist structure, property holding democracy. And that at the end of the day, dessert is right, and you work hard, and you get rewarded. So the like the libertarians are right. It's just that the libertarians aren't factoring in like maybe this injustice or this history. But it's almost like a cleaning up project. Let's just right. get that injustice or history out the way and get back to atomized individuals holding property and trading yeah. with each other. Um, and I think, maybe this is a slightly idealistic read, but I think there has been a real shift in post and you cover this history in your books, so I'm not trying to teach you anything here. Um, um, a, a bit away from that, you had kind of like the capacities approach, and then I think the real penny drop moment was Elizabeth Anderson's What's the Point of Equality, where right. it's just like, no, the point of equality isn't to like clean up the injustices so we can get back to individual property holding and trading. The point of equality is there's all sorts of social goods that sort of come online with it that are kind of actually just independent of that. Like status hierarchies of corrosive of human well-being and flourishing. Um, there's all sorts of sort of democratic, communal, whatever. I, you, you know the arguments, I'm not going to rehearse mm -hmm. them all, that come online. And I like to think the field is sort of moving in that direction or maybe just merely that my thinking has moved in that direction and i'm projecting that onto the the field um but yeah um i to, to sorry to put a closing point on it and then i'll put it get, put it back to you i do get a, a little bit instinctively suspect of arguments that seemingly have very radical conclusions but that seem to be accepting a view of the world that we generally don't it's, mm -hmm. it's incongruous, if nothing else. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think part of the problem is that people... I mean, I think the way that you're putting it is helpful because the way that I see what's going on here is people are kind of conclusion-mongering, mm. right? And people are like, well, how can I get from what the field accepts to you know, away from these repugnant conclusions or towards these progressive conclusions. And, you know, I'm kind of, I'm just kind of like, fuck that. No, like, what, <laughs> what do you, what do you think is the answer? Right. Yeah. That's what we're supposed to be doing here. Um, and, you know, we can always, you know, we can always have a conversation about the assumptions. Um, but we have, 
in our field better norms than most about just kind of, you know, stipulating some stuff and getting started. That's how Rawls hmm. <laughs> changed the whole game, right? So, you know, why is it that why is there this methodological conservatism of, you know, trying to make the least revisions to the framing assumptions possible and still getting out progressivism? I don't see the point of that unless you unless you actually believe in those fundamental assumptions, in which case that's fine. But but if you don't, I don't, I don't see any point in producing those sorts of arguments. Maybe as a discursive strategy, if you're talking to someone who is a strong libertarian, to sort of say, okay, we agree on this, let's yeah. see if we can move forward. But as a sort of way of building a systematic philosophy, it just, yeah, like, do you think it's right or not? And let's go from right. there, you know? Right, yeah, yeah. So, so how does that then feed into what you do recommend? Because... Your, your. Well, no, I'll just ask you rather than try and paraphrase it. Your your account um, sets itself apart from harm repair models. How and why? How and why is how do why do I set myself apart from yeah. harm repair models? Yeah. Okay, so how I set the constructive view apart from harm repair models is uh, the target the thing that the view is supposed to accomplish so on the harm repair view what reparation should accomplish is making the recipients of reparations better off right and this is at least presented in abstraction from a justificatory story that would take larger stock of the world um or take into account political conditions even broader than whatever is necessary to bring on that result. Um, and there's a number of reasons that I don't like that. <laughs> um, but, you know, maybe it's at least enough to get started to say that it would still happen on the constructive view that if you built a just world um the lives of the quote-unquote recipients of reparations would be improved hmm. right so so the constructive view just kind of strictly dominates hmm. the harm repair view at the level at, at this level of abstraction right it's something that both views like plus some other stuff on the constructive view. Then you get to change the broader unfair political ecology that helps explain why people's lives weren't better to begin with, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so that's what separates them argumentatively. The constructive view is just trying to do additional things, change the political structures that people live in, um, that the harm repair view isn't necessarily trying to do. But I think part of the reason why, why I bother to do this isn't just that I think the constructive view, you know, in some kind of decision theoretic sense is better. Um, but I think... the harm repair the way of pol the way of thinking about politics that is behind the harm repair view is potentially self undermining in a way that i don't think is true about the constructive view why so you know if it is certainly possible to um win politics, you know, win politics. It's certainly possible to advance your own group's political objectives in a way that is kind of um, single-mindedly focused on what's going on with the group. It's exceedingly difficult to do that when you're at the bottom of the relevant political hierarchies. 
which is by definition the group of people that racial justice movements are about hmm. right you know the myopic self-interest thing works just instrumentally speaking if you can make people go along with what you're doing by force or you know by carrot or by stick right? um, but we're just talking about the people who aren't in the position to do that and that's not even to talk about from a moral perspective whether or not that's the right perspective which i think it's very clearly not right um but i just think that kind of politics whether we're talking about kind of crude realism um, or whether we're talking about some more principled standpoint just has nothing going for it. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's something that I'm trying to push against a little bit with the constructive view. So it's partly an efficacy concern about what that politics could actually do or look like. Yeah. Partly an efficacy concern, partly a justice concern, um, and I'm just kind of riffing off the fact that those two are aligned as closely as I think they're aligned on this issue. Um, if they were divergent, then it would be a tougher road to hoe, but they're not. Let me put this argument in my own words. There's a justice concern and an efficacy concern. The justice concern is that it's kind of at the at root a, a sort of desert argument, like one group deserves something because historically it's been taken from them, another ought to give because they're, by being beneficiaries of injustice, sort of morally culpable. I guess in my own words, I'd just say I'm a bit suspect of desert in general. I'm not saying it can do absolutely no work. Um, but actually, when you get to the bottom of a lot of practices that I find unjust, it's desert that's propping them up. Um, and I'm, I, I don't think it's well philosophically grounded. I don't think the separations people try and make between, like, what's luck or external circumstance and what's like really you sort of hold up at the end of the day so and and, and there's things that we also just know we care about like um i'm i'm a moral consequentialist in the sense a, a broad sense but i do it because everyone hates utilitarianism so i just <laughs> dig into that hole for pushback but like we know we don't like suffering that's not actually yeah. a stupid place to start from you know, right. and perhaps more relevant to the reparations argument, I'd argue there's forms of degradation, dishonor, humiliation that we can sort of put in a similar sort of camp. Um, and you'd want to start from there rather than something that's that philosophically suspect. On the efficacy side, it does lead to this sort of retort, which I will grant is true enough as an object level point of well, I didn't own any slaves, and... Mm -hmm. Now, you're always going to get stupid retorts. You'll never get away from that. But I do feel like... I, I, at least I'm just trying to put the argument in my own words as strong as I can. You are kind of walking into it with that one. Yeah. Of, you know? Um, I'll, I'll pause there, but that's my own words of what I sort of heard you saying. And no, yeah. Of, yeah. That's, that's, exactly, that's exactly what I'm after, and... You know, it's it's not just that people will it's not just that people will respond with, you know, I didn't own slaves. But you're kind of asking them to. Right. 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 right? Like if if the frame if the frame for what we're doing is based in notions of guilt and moral responsibility and blameworthiness that are really calibrated for m incomprehensibly different scales of ethical interaction. Um, I, I just, you know, I, I think you're at the very least inviting that reaction and it's hard to say what it's getting wrong other than the conclusion that reparations shouldn't happen 
Mm. Right? You take that away, and it's unclear what mistake is being made at all. Which is, of course, not to endorse it. I just wrote a book <laughs> defending <laughs> reparations, right? So, you know, I don't think I don't think much of the Biden own slaves argument. But, you know, I I think this is this circles back to where we started, right? Which is, um, you know, I think there's been some level of underthinking on the side of, you know, what is the right case to make or what's the right way to think about this or what's a justifiable way to think about this, you know, because, you know, the imagined enemy or the imagined, you know, interlocutor is this person who's denying that the social sky is in fact blue. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, well, There are other questions to ask, right? Mm. Um, then whether or not the person who says, but I didn't own slaves is mm. getting at the right conclusion about whether or not to do reparations. The social sky is blue. That will lead some people to get sunburn by whatever freak of history or luck or nature I'm so disposed as I'm, I don't get sunburn. So the social sky being blue benefits me and harms other people. All of that is like just brute facts about the world. There's then an additional question of, okay, what do you do normatively? And then I think in this particular case, okay, how do you feel about that? Do you, are you are, are, Is the ask at the end of the day that we want provision of sunscreen or is the ask I want you to feel guilty? Because, mm -hmm. you know... They're just different asks. Right. And I'll say this on the white side. I think it produces an unhealthy reaction. Tell, tell me if you think I'm getting this wrong. Um, not just from, like, white people who are sort of opposed to this, but white people who are sympathetic, in that when the ask does land, I'm not sure it, do it does anything useful, in that, you know, I've worked in quite a few in different levels of doing different things, and I won't go into my work history, but I've been on a number of these sort of diversity initiatives, which I know you take a, a critical eye of in your next book. And so many times I sort of see, I think well-intentioned white people, in the context of these like group discussions, do this huge like story about like how they didn't understand this first stuff at first, but then someone broke it down and I felt so bad and I mm -hmm. felt so guilty. And then they stop talking. <laughs> and I don't think this is like malicious it's not the worst thing no. in the world yeah. but like or the other one is they, they, they someone brings up some sort of concern about some issue that pertains to race or gender or what have you and they listen and then they say yeah I, I really acknowledge my white privilege and I feel like right. there's an and after that sentence, yeah. you know, because like, what are you actually communicating there? Are you saying that, like, I have been a beneficiary of an unjust double standard or are you saying I am? In which case, which double standards and what are you doing about it? Right. You know, I just I, I, I it can produce a type of speech that's kind of functionless. I, I don't know. That's something I've noticed, which is a bit of a bugbear of mine. Yeah, it's, but it's all downstream of this way of framing racial justice and racial injustice and reparations on the terrain of interpersonal moral successes and failures, right? Which is ultimately what's happening here, right? Like you are stained maybe because of what you did or maybe because of what your presumptive ancestors did or maybe because of the interaction of what your presumptive ancestors did and your failure to recognize it. But like, what is important is your relationship to this history, mm -hmm. not the material conditions confronting everyone, not the makeup of the institutions that we're in, not the distributions of resources, not people's actual life chances. And, you know, if nothing else, what the harm repute, what the harm repair view gets right is a kind of 
laser focus on like no checks. Yeah. Right. That's what we're doing. We're getting checks. You feel bad. Great. Whatever. Whatever will get you to give us the checks. And that's like much closer to what I think is the good way of thinking about this than the relationship repair view is. Um, and it's, you know, much closer to what I think, um, what I think the right outlook or the most helpful outlook is on this in general. But, you know, in either case, I think there's a failure to contend with the scale of what we're talking about. Yeah. In the closing of your book, I'm paraphrasing, you say people who do injustice, you know, your Hitlers, your British empires, your whatever, they're very ambitious in the injustice that they propose yeah. to do, and we need to have equivalent ambitions. Yes. Absolutely. Um, they're very ambitious about the time scale. They're trying to build generations worth of wealth. They're very ambitious about the, you know, spatial scale. They're making investments all the way across the world and managing portfolios and contributing to political movements that are trying to stop leftists over there and trying to, you know, increase the influence of their lobby over here. And they're not doing that out of fanaticism. They're doing that out of a correct understanding of what actually has to be the case for them to succeed at what they're trying to do. And that is simply to say that they're responding to the actual scale of politics that confronts us, which is global and which is multi-generational. And they have devised all sorts of means um, to distract us from realizing that politics happens at that scale because then they're more likely to win. But, you know, we need to get out from under that, I think. You've got a list of them at the end, and we won't have time to cover all of them. But what are some things that, that are like maybe not ultimate utopian goals, but like medium run things that you want us to be practicing or calling for based on the whole argument we've just covered, which is given the sky is blue and colonialism happened and we're not too fussed by a sort of individualistic nickel and sensing, but a sort of forward-looking project to make a freer and more just world informed by history okay and what's what's the xyz of that maybe just one or two examples that you'd like to close with yeah i mean the focus on unconditional cash transfers especially you know checks right from the harm repair theorists that's totally that's totally right um, that's one of the most direct ways that you can change who has measures of economic power, which are convertible to other forms of power. And so any kind of unconditional cash transfer that people can push for, whether it's at the level of individuals, you know, baby bonds or trust funds for African American sense of slavery or um, um, even at the national or collective level, maybe reparations to the governments of Jamaica and Barbados. You know, all those sorts of things are great things to push for. Um, but those are huge things that would take a lot of pressure on governments to do. There are other things that you can win at at a local level that I think will also be important. Anybody at any institution that invests money can participate in the divestment campaign. Right? Take your money out of fossil fuels and prisons and put it into things that aren't extractive or destructive in the way that those things are. Um, the so-called divest-invest strategy that um, lots of groups fighting for racial justice have talked about and supported. And I'll just add one more. 
um, moving decision making power and not just money and resources is also a really important idea. Um, whether we're talking about in the form of participatory budgeting, so direct democratic control over public finance or um, energy democracy, community level control over how energy or other utilities are produced and managed. But moving resources, moving decision-making power, those are the things you've got to do to reshape the world around us. And they're not all or nothing gambits. You can win bits of territory. You can stop this privatization of this city. You can win divestment of this university from fossil fuels. You can make progress other than the total world historical victory um, of at a planetary scale. And I think that's the only way that a world historical victory at a planetary scale could be won. Yeah. Um, one point on the cash transfers, and then maybe we'll close with the, the fossil fuels, because that's the whole side of your book we didn't even really get to. Um, I sometimes feel there's this view of like cash transfers as like quite an old-fashioned idea of reparations and the more modern view is like doing i actually wonder if it's the opposite in that like just give people money is kind of the direction contemporary liberalism is going in from sort of the checks we got in covid boosted unemployment the somewhat abortive attempt to do a child tax credit in the u.s um, and it seems to me there's fairly good progressive liberal reasons to... F it's not incongruous with a sort of even quite traditional liberalism, because what's the libertarian concern deep down, or the valid one, is the government in trying to help will impose a particular life plan on people. That's mm -hmm. the valid core of it, right? And so just give people money then, and, like, don't tailor it to like if you check x y and z boxes don't worry about the undeserving and the deserving poor middle class people's lives will still get better if they get that extra grand it is fine right. um and then they're free and, and don't make them participate in systems where they have to go through a complex and degrading series of rituals where at every point it's assumed that they're trying to do something wrong you know, right, right. like I'd rather waste a bit of money giving it to people who don't need it than waste a lot of money with whatever the heck it is that happens to someone when they um, apply for a visa or unemployment insurance, right. you know, and yeah. I think that the scale of even I think mainstream liberalism is increasingly okay with that proposition. And the, the scale of it is only really limited, not even by our Democratic Party, but just by the quite archaic political structures that the yep. US has. Um, and so, in principle, like, you could sort of do a universal plus reparations. We're giving people money, and we're giving particular identified groups more. That all seems to fit for me without having to really believe anything especially radical. Yeah, it does fit. And uh, Dorian Warren uh, at the Economic Security Project actually put together, uh, you know, something of a proposal for this, right? Do a universal basic income with an additional amount for those who are descended from African-Americans who were enslaved, right? So that idea is out there. It's a kind of universalism that I think has legs that is compatible with liberalism. I think it's definitely... It's definitely politically promising, for sure. Um, it's where it's it's the kind of place I would start if I were trying to do this. Okay, and on reparations, you mentioned um, divesting from fossil fuels. Why? Why is global warming? I mean, I think this follows pretty naturally from our sky is blue and there's um, a, a racist system of global domination. But why is why is global warming a racial justice issue? Because racial justice is a construction project, right? So you have ordinary practical reasons to think that climate justice is going to determine what you can build in the same way that if you were literally building a physical house, the, what, the weight that the ground could support would be um, something that you had to take into account, something that was part and parcel of 
getting the job done. Um, so there are these higher flying conceptual, even historical connections between climate crisis and racial justice. But the one that really matters is just this straightforward practical one. You will not succeed at building racial justice, at building a world that's compatible with racial justice if the world that wins is a four degree world with great power competition and sea level rise confronting our systems of social injustice. Cool. Um, let's close that. Anything else you want to add? And um, why don't you mention your book one more time and let the audience know where they can get it? No, um, I think that I think we covered it. Uh, Reconsidering reparations. Uh, you can get that from the publisher or on bookshop.org. Um, and same with Elite Capture, which comes out in May. Cool. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks a lot.